nothing and it went off and you got no, no, This member decapitated. It's probably because you're trying to hide something and make sure certain details don't come out. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back, guys. My name is Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life, where we talk all things true crime. The good, the bad, unfortunately, the really ugly, and oftentimes even the conspiracies. We really just try to generate awareness so that we can hopefully bring some justice to some victims, whether it's real-time cases or cases that unfortunately have gone cold and are long forgotten. So if you're brand new, stopping by for the first time, welcome. I am happy to have you here. If you enjoy the coverage today, make sure to hit that subscribe button below so that you get notified of new videos as they get posted. And for all of you returning, tend to lifers, tend to life subscribers, welcome back. You already know what we do here. I don't need to explain to you. It is absolutely freezing here today. It is pouring rain, so I apologize in advance if you hear raindrops through the mic and if it's like some weird little echo chamber. I apologize. The case we're going to be talking about today, guys, is one that I know most of you are probably familiar with, but there are some updates. We're going to talk about those, and it's the case of Oren and Orson West. Oren and Orson are brothers out of Bakersfield, California originally, and they went missing from Cal City, California back in December 2020 three and four years old brothers and this story when it first hit the news it took the media by storm everybody was talking about it because there were so many red flags there were so many crazy interviews and weird information and then statements made from other family members I mean it was a really hard to keep up guys I've made quite a few videos on the case on my channel here as did many other youtubers out there and everybody was really just trying to piece together any information possible to figure out what happened to these two babies and it's now been almost a year. I can't believe that. I cannot believe it's been almost a year, guys. In literally one week, it will be exactly one year since they were reported missing. How we are still at this point blows my mind. Now, there have been some updates and new statements made and some new leads, and I'm going to go into those with you. But first, I want to give you guys just a quick comprehensive overview of the case and timeline of events, because as I mentioned, at first when this hit, it was a frenzy out there. There were videos popping up every other day, new information surfacing. So it was really hard to keep track of what the truth was, what the facts were, and what the timeline was. So before we go into the updates, I want to just really give you guys that clear, comprehensive overview, especially for those who aren't familiar to the case, and what that timeline of events was. And also, we're going to look at a lot of that footage again and re-dissect it, like the infamous interview, some of the surveillance footage, because the whole thing, it's just, it's too crazy. If you've been watching my channel too, you know that when all of this first broke, I reached out to one of Trezell's friends, and she spoke with me on the phone and gave me a lot of information, which included a ton of freaking red flags, and we're going to talk about that too. So let's just go back and start from the beginning, and I'm going to keep this overview and timeline brief because I know the majority of you guys have already followed it. If you want to do more of a deep dive on it you certainly can you can go to the playlist on my channel but I want to just kind of give this one big comprehensive overview and then we'll go into the updates. Oren and Orson West are three and four years old. They are brothers who lived in Bakersfield, California, but at birth, they were originally named Sincere and Classic. However, in 2018, they were taken away from their biological parents due to a suspicious leg injury. Now, the relatives all insist that this was not inflicted, that it was an accident. However, they unfortunately were then put into the system. Trezell and Jackie West then came along, and they are both in their early 30s, and they began fostering the boys and ultimately adopted them. And when they adopted the boys, they renamed them Orin and Orson. In addition to these two boys, they also had two biological children of their own and two additional adopted children, bringing the entire clan to six children. In September 2020, the West family decided to move from Bakersfield to Cal City, which is a little bit weird, and some statements were made surrounding that move that seemed bizarre because, in my opinion, usually, again, just from being in this area, Usually you would move from Cal City to Bakersfield, not the opposite, just because Bakersfield is a more populated city, but who knows? In any event, they moved from Bakersfield to Cal City in September 2020. However, just a few short months later, the two brothers, three and four years old, were reported missing. And in addition to the unlikelihood of two toddler brothers going missing and vanishing without a trace, 
the circumstances and information that soon came out was just so alarming and really disturbed everybody. And that's why there was such this media frenzy that I referred to, because nothing was adding up, nothing was making sense, and even the parents themselves looked extremely guilty, in my opinion at least. So the day is December 21st, 2020, and Trizel and Jackie report that Trizel was in the backyard bringing firewood in and out of the house to then light a fire to keep warm. Meanwhile, Jackie was inside the house wrapping Christmas gifts for all of the children. And Orin and Orson were the only kids at the house, though, at the time, and we're going to get to that in a minute, too, but the other four siblings weren't there. They were reportedly in the backyard playing with chalk. Now, there has been a lot of conversation about the chalk situation because at first it was implied that they were playing with sidewalk chalk, drawing on a concrete slab in the backyard as Trizel was bringing the firewood in and out. Then later it came out that the name of their family dog was named Chalk and somebody actually had been driving next to them. Trizel was walking the dog. They yelled Chalk. The dog looked and then it was like all hell broke out on the internet and everybody's like, Chalk's the dog. It's the dog. It's not drawing Chalk. So let me just be clear. Even though it seems like such a frivolous, like tiny irrelevant detail it still hasn't been confirmed if it was in fact drawing chalk or if it was chalk the dog and if that is the dog's name but in any event Trizel and Jackie say that the boys were in the backyard playing with chalk while he was bringing the firewood and she was wrapping Christmas gifts after he went out for the last trip to gather wood he noticed that the side gate was left open and the boys were missing he went back into the house to ask his wife hey where are the boys are they in here with you she says no and they began searching for them in a panic well according to them it was a panic and we're gonna get to if it really was because spoiler alert it wasn't at this point, the only information that was out there in the media was that these two boys vanished without a trace, that nobody knows where they went, that Jackie and Trizel searched the neighborhood frantically and called the police, but that nobody had any leads or knew what was going on. Then, to their own detriment, in my opinion, they gave an interview two days later. And before we go into the timeline and the footage and all of the red flags, I want to watch this interview with you guys, and I want to get your thoughts. And I'm going to pause it a little bit along the way because... I believe this interview is solely what blew this case up. I think it seemed like relatively understandable circumstances that these two boys went missing. Perhaps they were kidnapped. Perhaps they were taken. But then once these parents did this interview, it was like a bomb went off and everybody was just like, what the hell did I just watch? So let's just recap here for a sec. Uh, we just want to thank everyone in the community for all the support we've seen. We felt so helpless and seeing everybody out here really looking and helping out really means a lot. So, tell us what happened the night that kids went missing. Okay. From our yard. Okay. First, that was a bizarre to me and tell me what you guys think. How she hurt. The first thing she says is, from our yard. Like, she's trying to tee up the story but guys it gets even worse just watch it was cold i was gonna make a fire so a lot of wood in this, this area right here next to our house i opened up the back gate i'm throwing wood bringing it inside the house my wife's inside she was actually wrapping gifts so we thought it was a good idea that they got our youngest to go outside and play with chalk on the, the back patio there's that chalk statement and I just want, as we're following along and listening, and I'm not going to pause it every second, I promise you. To me, and I want to get your thoughts too, it seems very much like he is just trying to remember this version of events in this story. Not, I was out in the backyard doing this, then they were gone. Like, it's very much, it was cold. So I was lighting a fire. I was gathering wood. We thought it would be a good idea for them to play with chalk. It's just very cut and dry, bizarre, bizarre. Do not let them go on the dirt in the backyard and keep them close. They was playing with chalk and I came in the house. I saw them there. I went in the house. I came back out. I didn't see them now. I Sorry guys, I promise I'm not going to be super annoying with this pausing, but do you see how the wife just keeps nodding her head? Almost like, yeah, like I think it's almost she's doing it not even knowing that she's doing it, but kind of being like, yep, you're, you're telling the story right. Yep, that's what happened. That, yep, keep going. I immediately went back in, asked my wife, did you see the boys? She said, no, they should be outside playing with chalk. 
I said, well, I didn't see them, so I came back outside and I started searching my backyard. I searched the whole thing. I realized that I left the gate open and I panicked, came inside the house, searched the house, me and my wife. Once that had not pan out, I got in the van. Also, another weird choice of words, once that didn't pan out, rather than I didn't find them, so I decided to go in the van and search. And she's swaying back and forth very nervously. His hands, and I said this before, and I know everybody compares everything to Watts, but he's standing exactly like Chris Watts did in that infamous interview of Watts on his front porch. The whole thing just, from the get-go, starts looking bad to me. But what do you think? I looked down the street, most directions. It was getting dark, getting cold, and I got in the van and I hit a bunch of corners. I went down this street. Remember that? Hit a bunch of corners. On, I searched. I searched. I called their names. I searched. I, I searched. On the street on the other side over there, he didn't see them. So then I came home and I told my wife, "We need to call the cops. It's getting dark and I need help. We gotta get going." That's a very important detail that I want you guys to remember. He says, "So then I got home from doing this neighborhood search and told my wife we need to call the cops." First of all, I get it. Maybe you didn't want to call the cops initially because you figured they were in the front yard or they were playing and you didn't want to, you know, create panic. But just remember that detail. He says after he returned home from the search, he went inside to tell her to call the cops. So I called the cops. Cops came. First thing they did was tell us to stay in the house so they can get a hold of us. And they had us just sitting there and we wanted to keep searching. But everybody came out in droves, and I wanted to thank you guys that night, but we couldn't go outside. The cops told us the best are out here. The best are out here searching, and we appreciate it, and nobody ever could tell, we could never talk to anybody, and that was the issue. They're trying to justify something right here. They're trying to justify why they didn't search more. They're trying to justify why they stayed inside. Once we get to this entire timeline, guys, like, and we just kind of reference back to this hysterical, comedic, horrible acting job, in my opinion, it, you're going to see it just every single piece of this interview, it gets broken apart. We just want to thank everybody. We really want to and, thank you, uh, God. Please, if anybody has seen them, please call. Let somebody know. It, it, call the cops. Call California the City Police Department. Call them and let them know what you've seen, if you see anything. Our boys, they, they are going to be rambunctious, okay? Okay. I have so many things to unpack with that statement. First of all, he says, our boys are going to be rambunctious. That is the first adjective that he uses, that either of them use, to even describe their two children. They haven't even called them by name at this point in the interview. They haven't described what they were last seen wearing, what they look like, how they act, their names, nothing. Also, not shedding a single tear. The first thing they say is, they're going to be rambunctious. And then you notice he gets frustrated with himself for saying that, almost as though it's a slip up. Almost, in my opinion, as though the boys being rambunctious, which, hello, give me a three- and four-year-old toddler boy who's not, that maybe that is what ultimately created a, a, enough frustration from them to reach a boiling point. But listen. <clears throat> they are going to be here in this area. So I'm just going to rewind here. Listen. Listen again. Our boys, they, they are going to be rambunctious, okay? Uh, they are going to be here in this area. He gets frustrated with himself like, oh, that's not what I want to say. And they're going to be here in this area. Show me any missing persons case when there has been an interview done by the parents or anybody where they say they're going to be in this area, only this area, search this area. No, 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 no. You all, everybody always says... We don't know where they could have gone, where they would have wandered off to. Please search everywhere. Search your yard. Search your street. Cast a wide net. They are adamant they are going to be here. Almost as if, in my opinion, that they don't want anybody looking elsewhere. Because maybe they will be elsewhere. And I really would like to go in the houses. But it's not because I want to invade people's privacy. I just want to know if make they sure. make sure. That's it. 
because I don't oh, go ahead I'm sorry if you got any questions oh no you're good oh, okay. I, I was just going to say you know this is the first time we're hearing from you guys and I can't imagine what you guys are going through I can't even fathom it um, for you guys for people who are thinking uh, that there's some kind of foul play involved um, you know, we just spoke to the biological mother. She says she had a conversation with you guys um, and that she thinks there's some kind of foul play involved. That she thinks you guys did something. And that's understandable. What's your, what's your response to that? That's understandable. I would think the same thing. Yep. I mean, that's exactly the point. And if we can find our, find our babies, then guess what? That's, that's no. Okay. Again, and I said this when I first went over this interview months and months and months ago. If they're saying people suspect foul play, the biological mother thinks that maybe you guys were involved and they're saying that's understandable. Yeah, that's understandable. I would too. First of all, it's not understandable if you love your children and you never have had any sort of, you know, behavior indicating otherwise. But wouldn't you also, and maybe it's just me telling what you guys think in the comments, but wouldn't the appropriate response to that be like, you know, I understand they're just looking for answers. We would absolutely never hurt our children. We love those boys. We want to find them. Being giving them some sort of reassurance but there's not there's just it's understandable it's understandable and that's all i want is to find a baby sit and i talked to her this morning and i really wanted to tell her that um, i am completely sorry because we were entrusted with her children and they came to us and they became our children and we named them and they are they are our children and so we want them back if they're your children, why are you not even saying their names right now on camera? Why are you not making a public plea and outcry for your boys? No description, no tears, no personal names, nothing. Get back on your what you guys are doing. We should we should be able to get a hold of somebody, but they took all of our tech, so they wanted to, I guess, uh, just rule us out, which makes sense. That's part of the investigation. So that's pretty much it. Have you guys, um, you talked to the police all last night? Yes. Um, what? So you guys willfully gave them your Everything. technology? Yes. The car? Yes. Did they get a, how did they get a search warrant? Did you I, guys? I, oh, no I don't see why they got one, but they got one. Yeah, we would have let them take one, anything. We would have let them take everything. We let them come in and search with us. Isn't it weird how we, they just are zooming in on his body back. language? What did they take? just tech just tech and that's it like our phones from the house oh well uh, i guess should i answer that or answer it does yeah okay so into the into the okay and i guess i don't even know i see yeah we seriously that like we needed to be out here we did uh again we were told the best are out here looking already just to stay put they have more questions and there was then, literally a cop with us the whole time in there he was he had sitting down we would ask can we go help they had to sit said down no nope. he said no we got the best out there so we it's need not you guys here because we have more questions. i don't want you guys thinking we, we didn't try we actually we looked tried. before we called we the police looked, yes. And I imagine the uh, mind-boggling part is the search for information. What happened? Where are they? Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. And we're, yeah. And, and just so we are able to present the information correctly, um, at what time did you guys notice your kids went missing? And at what time were they reported missing to the police? It's about, I, I believe, I think it was about 4.30, going on 5. It was getting dark, like I said. 5. We're going to go over this footage in a second. That's when everything played out. And then when did you guys call the police to report that missing? I After we searched yeah. a little bit around here, we it was dark, so we definitely were, we got worried. So again, they just double downed on that. After they searched is when they called the police. I just, oh, sorry. I just want you guys to remember that. Uh, would, would you say it was maybe within an hour, a couple hours? No, it was within minutes of us. What do you guys want people at home to understand um, about this situation? For them, you know, 
even speaking about what you guys are feeling is difficult. What do you want them at home to understand about this whole situation? We're going through it. It's difficult. I, I mean, everybody's making their own, ups 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 you know, their own conclusions. Odd to me that she's saying we're going through it and everybody's making their own assumptions and drawing their own conclusions. So much of this interview is deflecting from the boys actually missing and in my opinion, more so them trying to prove their innocence or their uninvolvement. If, they're, if somebody's asking you, if your children are missing and a reporter's asking you, what do you want the public to know? You think you, the first thing you would say is that we're going through it? Or would you say as a loving parent that we want our children home if you have them or if you saw something please say something if you're watching this we love you not we want the public to know we're going through it oh great great i bet you are i bet the boys are going through worse or i did go through worse just an assumption they don't know anything we don't we're not sure exactly like everything we're not sure we we said what we knew and if anybody has seen them uh, or anything, please call the police department. Would you be willing to provide pictures or do you have any? They, uh, I have older pictures. All my newest were on my phone. I want you to remember that too because we're going to talk about the last known photos of the two boys. She's saying that all the newest ones were on my phone, which the police seized their tech. The police have never released any f uh, current photos of the boys that had recent timestamps on her phone. In fact, the last photo that was confirmed to be the boys and the last one taken was from Thanksgiving 2019, almost a full year prior. And this is just one of the many inconsistencies and many red flags. Okay. A lot of people are speaking of this as, you know, after the mass past tense. I want to talk about your kids in present tense. What kind of what kind of boys are these? Tell, tell us about the boys. Very playful, very rambunctious, and they do love to wrestle. They they do love to kind of get rough with each They're other. Kids. They're kids. Of course, they would love to go out, but we would so during the pandemic we weren't trying to go, you know, out here, and so we stayed inside. Did you guys ever go out and search? Yes, yes we did. We searched before we called the cops. That's that what was, that's what yeah. we were saying. What time did they come up missing? They came missing right before it got dark. <clears throat> and then we call. I I searched that property. I even drove around the, the whole, this neighborhood right here. I even talked to a gentleman on that side, one of those streets over there. I said, "Did you see my some little black kids?" Did you and go that way looking for them. That's the way I was going to come. But when I came back home, I decided to call the cops because it was dark. Like, they couldn't have got away that fast. And and why did it take two people to go in the house and leave? two kids out here by themselves. It should have been one parent going in and one parent right here watching the child. Not two parents going in the house oh, oh, and leaving so you, two little kids out here by themselves for 10 minutes. No, they were in the backyard. And the so back gate was open. the backyard? And the back gate was open and I was getting wood so from this lot here. So you guys unresponsible and left the gate open. Left some little kids outside with the gate open. All right, uh, uh, Ignoring the question. Right, you guys were ta talking about your boys who you're, you know, uh, I understand. Um, for a mother, uh, a mother's intuition, I know you were saying, and we, we'll get your names after this, but you were saying how you feel like they're in this area. Uh, do you feel the same way? And what is the intuition? What is the sense you get? What do you think happened to your boys? Do you think someone took them? Do you think they're lost? Do you think yeah, definitely. I definitely know they're not walking around. They're not that kind. They 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 do not just roam around. You know these patches. They definitely, I think, definitely would have been picked up or something. That's that was my assumption. Have they ever taken off of the No. Nope. No. No. They've never taken off. No. You guys are new to Cal City, right? Yeah. How long have you guys been living here? Three, three months. You can hear the outrage from everybody behind these interviewers. Nobody's buying it. It's crazy because y'all say y'all came out looking for the kids, and y'all got neighbors that say y'all ain't even came out looking for the kids. The we, neighbors we, weren't out here. We were looking. We were looking.
I'm just saying, bro. It's, it's, it's crazy, bro. I got kids of my own. Where do you I'm, live? I'm, them little boys that y'all raised, them is my biological family. I understand. Family. I understand, bro. I don't need kids oh, outside. Nine, and I, I understand. I have Three nine kids. Year old. I have nine kids. There's, there's outside no in the backyard that I'm watching. Leave, leave my kids unattended. Three not even for a minute. Like, you sit here, you sit here, here. I get. Like, we get that. We get it. They're in the backyard. We feel it. But you said the kids. You hear that? He hear that? He says you don't even look like you're worried, which he doesn't. No tears, no distress, very clear cut, trying to be very matter of fact, remembering the version of events. It was cold, so I got some wood. I wanted to start a fire. Like, it's just, ugh, gross. Oh, y'all know y'all finna go inside the house, right? Y'all yeah. are foster parents, right? No, no okay, we're adopted. Y'all adopted parents. them, yeah, right? They are okay, children. shut the gate. Go in the house. Why did it take both of y'all to go in the house and leave them outside by themselves? I understand. And y'all know why, why the gate you, was why, open. Why haven't y'all been out with the people around this neighborhood looking with the kids? We, because we, told, gonna, we already told we already on camera. That. We I already told y'all on no cameras last night. No. I didn't even see y'all out here praying with them people. Them people was out to take care of my nephew. Not this not supposed to happen. I understand. Y'all was supposed to take care of my nephew. I understand. You actually... Like, how is she more upset than them? Which I get it, blood relative, absolutely. But still, there should be equal emotion at the very minimum. As the parents, I would expect you to even show maybe possibly more emotion. Nothing, just very cold. And if anybody's watching at home who knows anything, or if you, if somebody who, who has these kids, if they're watching, what is your message to them? The message has always been, as, much, as, as soon as possible, call the California City Police Department. And please bring our babies home. And that's that. <laughs> One of the reasons why. And that's that. Want to this is the reason why. The because we were, we were under orders to stay in the house and stay because they're going to need to be contacted. And we could not, and we cannot go outside. And that was the issue. And that was the issue. We were under orders by the cops to stay home in the house and let the let the professionals look. But you just said that they were your children. If they were, if, you, if they were your children, regardless of what somebody told you, wouldn't you want to go look for them? Well, we have cops actually posted in, in the front yeah, door right there. We I totally we understand. Totally that. understand. We understand. Told, if you guys please, if you guys actually have that question, we should ask the police officer. Okay, so let me just pause this here for a minute, guys. Okay. So clearly, a ton of red flags in that initial interview. And when this interview went public, everybody was outraged. Picking apart, we had, you know, behavior experts, um, body language experts, everybody weighing in on what this interview was and what a circus this had become. Then, shortly after this interview, footage gets released from a neighbor because we know neighbors have ring cameras, video cameras, everything, and I bet you that Trizelle and Jackie didn't count on that because then the footage that got released countered so much and contradicted so much of what they said in this interview. So with this footage, let's go through the actual real timeline of events. Because remember, Trizel says he noticed they were gone. They went searching the neighborhood everywhere. He was out there searching, then came back and decided to call the police. Here we go. So from 412 to 421, the footage does show Trezell going in and out of the backyard, presumably collecting what he had said was the firewood. At 421, he goes back inside and the lights go on and off. This suspected to be the time in which he asks Jackie if the boys were in there with him and they were looking in the house for the boys. At 432, we see Trezell come out of the house and jump directly through the passenger side of his van to go search the neighborhood. However, what strikes me as very odd about this is on his way through the front yard to the van, it's a direct path. He doesn't look in the front yard anywhere, which if the boys had wandered out of the side gate into the front yard and through the street, wouldn't you search that front yard per right away, whether it's the front stu doorstep, the lawn, whatever it is, he goes directly and beelines it to the car. First thing, while he's driving around on that footage, Jacqueline never comes out. She never searches the front yard. She never even goes and searches the backyard. She stays in that ent that house that entire time. Now, what you normally would think, possibly, and the only excuse in my opinion for somebody not searching for their kids on the property itself is because they're inside calling the police. 
but we know they said they didn't call the police until Trezell returned back from searching the neighborhood. So why was she still in the house? Why wasn't she searching anywhere? Is it because she knew she wasn't going to find them? So Trezell's doing this mass neighborhood search, like he says in the interview. Except it's not a mass neighborhood search at all, because he returns on that camera at 4.39 p.m., six minutes after he left. He searched that neighborhood for six whole minutes. So there's red flag number, what, three, four, five? I don't even know at this point. She's not searching anywhere, and he goes out and searches for six minutes and then returns home. Now what's interesting, he gets out of the car from that search, and he doesn't go inside. So when does he tell his wife to call the police? Like he says in this interview, he never once goes inside, and she still does not come outside. But instead, he stands at a tree in the front yard for 13 minutes. That is double, more than double, the amount of time that he was actually searching the neighborhood. So the police then finally arrive. I believe that the wife did call the police. I don't believe Trezell did. I believe the wife did, and I believe she did when he went out in the neighborhood to search because we don't see him ever go inside to tell her, I didn't find the boys. Now's the time to call the police. We also don't see her come out of the house when he returns and say, hey, did you find the boys? No, let me run inside and call the police. And if she doesn't come out of the house to ask him if he found them, and if he doesn't go in the house to tell her that he didn't find them, how did they both know already that the boys hadn't been found and that there was no need to communicate? Do you see what's off there? They both, he returns home. She's staying inside all the while yet they both somehow know that the other hadn't found the boys. How, if they haven't talked? So I believe that Jacqueline called the police while he was driving through the neighborhood for those six minutes. Then he knows that the police are on their way. He already knows the police are on their way. That's why he's standing by the tree. But he hadn't told her to call the police. And he stands by that tree for 13 minutes, double the amount of time that he actually searched the neighborhood. Throughout the whole footage, Jackie never left the house once in that full 40 minute stretch she never went in the backyard never went in the front yard never went to a neighbor's house nothing stayed in the house tell me one single parent besides maybe casey anthony who wouldn't search the front or backyard of their house if their two toddlers were missing show me that parent and i'll show you someone who probably shouldn't be a parent at 452 The police arrive, Trezell goes back into his van, and they continue the search. So this was really damning evidence, guys, and this made everybody really pissed off. And everybody was talking about it, and it just really started to break apart their entire story. And that entire interview, it just everything coupled together appeared to everybody and to the public that these two people were guilty somehow. Still not proven at this point, let me be clear. So the police do their search, and then they bring in dogs in the house. And now the dogs reportedly did pick up the scent inside the house, but they did not pick up any sort of scent outside where they reportedly were playing with chalk, whether it was the dog or sidewalk chalk or whatever they were playing with. So could it be that the scent that they did find in the house did in fact belong to the boys, but could it have been on linens, clothing, toys, bedding? anything that had been in the boys' possession from their previous home in Bakersfield, and then that scent travels on those belongings to Cal City without the boys actually ever being present? Is that possible? Yes, it is. Because there was no scent picked up outside of the house ever from these dogs. And these canines that were tracking the children's scent didn't even catch a trail of them leaving the house. So it's my belief, and many others' belief, that the boys never even made it to Cal City. And I'm going to explain why in a minute here, in addition to there not being any sort of scent from the children outside. Before we get to that, let's talk about the other children because we know that when this entire vanishing took place, Orin and Orson were the only kids at the house. So where were the other four siblings? Trezell and Jackie say that they were on vacation with their grandparents. So sure enough, as luck would have it, there was footage from the neighbor. And that footage showed that just a couple of days earlier, on Saturday, December 19th, it shows them all come out of the house and load up into the van. But the footage only shows four kids loading up into that van. Later, Trezell and Jackie said it was because they wanted to go Christmas shopping. And so they all went to Bakersfield to go Christmas shopping. 
But remember, this footage comes out and there's only four kids going in the van, not six. So you're taking your four children Christmas shopping and leaving a three and four year old behind to fend for themselves? Or why wouldn't the other two boys go with you? It's my belief and my suspicion that when they went on this Christmas shopping escapade two days before the boys were reported missing, it was to drop the children off at the grandparents' house to have some sort of alibi for that vacation for them because the boys were no longer a part of the equation. If they were, I believe they would have taken all six of them to the grandparents' house. And even if not, even if they were only going to take four because six was too many for the grandparents to care for, Tell me why they would leave a three and four year old behind in the house. One parent would have stayed behind with them, you would think, correct? Unless there were no toddlers in that house to care for. So could it be that something had already previously happened to the boys and they were taking the other four children off site so that they could concoct this story and then execute this plan two days later? I think yes. I think pop. I think possibly because in addition to there not being any scent in addition to this weird fabricated in my opinion story of the children being at the grandparents but the two boys not being there in addition to the timestamps from the footage and showing that they didn't really search when they said they were searching they didn't really call the police when they said they were calling they don't really have any sort of emotion in addition to all of those red flags neighbors of the west family say they never have seen any children there in the four months that they lived there. Zero, zero activity. Now this is very unlikely, even in a pandemic, which I get it. At this point, everybody was still for the most part indoors, but you would see people coming and going every now and then. You would see maybe children in the backyard playing because they're still socially distanced. There was zero activity. The neighbors didn't even know that they had children. In fact, one of the neighbors whose house backs up to the West House says she only ever saw the man coming and going and that she never saw anybody else coming and going. And this case is so complex, guys. I feel like I need like a flow chart here. One of those things with like the strings on how it all connects because another big piece of this and one of the biggest suspicions out there is that this whole move to Cal City was a farce and that it the boys never even came to Cal City, that this was just a way to distract and disassociate from whatever happened truly in Bakersfield. And there's, I mean, guys, the details here, there's so much to unload. And I know I promised I would keep this brief. So again, if you want to do a deep dive, hit the other videos on here, but I'm going to try to keep this as high level as I can for you. That same neighbor also says that she doesn't believe children were ever at that house. That's a pretty bold statement. As I mentioned, the last photos that were actually taken of the boys that anybody had reference and record of was from November 2019, Thanksgiving. No recent photos, which is also very alarming because if there aren't any recent photos, tell me when they were at last actually alive and well and seen. I know I am a absolute psychopath with my kids and I'm taking probably like 20 pictures and three videos a day just because I'm like psycho mom but and I get it not everybody's my level of like being a lunatic which is probably healthy but in any event I would think that there would be for an entire year that passes birthdays holidays not any other photos strikes me as very interesting and it's because of this that the Bakersfield Police Department issues a press release and the wording of this release is very interesting and I'm not going to read the whole thing for you but I'll pull it up on the screen so you can pause it if you want to read but what I find really interesting is this one sentence here in the third paragraph and it says the Bakersfield Police Department is asking for anyone who had contact with Orin and Orson West within the past year regardless of the context to contact us immediately Now, this struck me as very important for this particular quote, regardless of context, because they don't care where you saw them. They don't care how you saw them, who they were with, where it was. They are just trying to build a timeline to see when the last time they were in fact seen alive. That seized tech that was taken from Trezell and Jackie also didn't give any insight into the boys or into when more photos were taken with recent timestamps. And it brought that huge question of was the move to Cal City to distance and distract from what may have happened in Bakersfield. So when all of this was surfacing and this interview was public, the footage was public, I of course felt like I needed to dive into this a little bit more because my mind was racing and my interest was immediately piqued. And so I started digging wherever I possibly could to get more information. And I stumbled across Trezell's public Venmo. 
transactions, which most of you guys know if you go on Venmo and find the username, unless they private it, you can see the Venmo transactions. So I started to see who he was paying, who he received payments from, and Googled those people to see who they were, see if I could make sense of it. And through that, I found his loan officer, his realtor, his home inspector, and some other people. And so I decided, you know what? I'm just going to reach out to these people. I'm going to ask them questions. I'm going to see if there's any information we can get that then we can transfer over to the police department and hopefully get some answers here. Now, I had purchased a home at around the same time they did, about a month before. And so I knew the process pretty well. So my first inclination was, I want to ask this home inspector if the fireplace was in fact working. Because if it wasn't, that was going to debunk the entire story of getting firewood first. And that, that whole story we would then know would be fabricated. So I wanted to ask the home inspector that. I also wanted to ask the realtor if he ever saw any of the children. Because typically, when you close on a house, you deliver the keys and it's usually at the property and the family's with you and it's, you know, a joyous event. So I wanted to ask him those questions. And then I also wanted to ask the loan officer what the finances were like and what she'd be willing to share with me, if anything, because could that possibly uncover a certain motive in this? So I started calling them. And to my surprise, they all talked to me and shared quite a bit of information. But to, I'm sure, the dismay of Trizel and Jackie, they shared a lot of damning information with that as well. The home inspector provided me of photos of the house while they were in escrow and the fireplace was in fact reported to be working because a home inspector does test all of those things. So he gives me photos because at first there was a lot of conversation. Could there be a trap door, this and that? And that was all debunked through these photos. And then the loan officer and I had several phone conversations and she detailed with me her interactions with Trizel. And those conversations for me are what really actually raised the most red flags in my opinion so let me explain why she couldn't outline specifics of of course his financial documents but what she did say is that he claims approximately ten thousand dollars a year from making beats and selling them on the internet um, and I think that averages to like 30 or 45 beats a year or something like that because he was selling them between two and three hundred dollars each she said the majority of their income did in fact come from fostering which was you know long suspected now she also told me how their loan was supposed to close in 30 days but due to the proof of income and some other paperwork hurdles it didn't close for four months and that over those four months they were talking all the time trying to iron this thing out and that they really started to develop a friendship a friendship where they would regularly have phone conversations and in-office meetings that would extend past the hour of just doing any sort of paperwork. And I want to be clear, I don't believe that this friendship ever turned romantic, although that was insinuated by a lot of people when I made this public. However, it is uncertain. I believe it was just a friendship because she appears to be happily married and he, I would think, is happily married. But, you know, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. I just know what she told me. However, I do know that one of the details she shared with me is that she loaned him $5,000 for move-in costs, and that's what I saw on that Venmo transaction. Now, she also says she loaned him this five grand with zero expectation of ever being paid back. That's a pretty good friend to have. If you're looking, if you're needing furniture or whatever you're needing to get into your house, and a friend who you've only known four months is saying, here's five grand for you, and I don't even expect to be paid back. It's a pretty good friend. And I think that's where the question really started surfacing if there was something more to this relationship. As she was telling me about their friendship, she says that it really stemmed because they had a lot of similar interests. They were both holistic, believed in being organic and healthy. They would often talk about conspiracy theories together like Pizzagate and things with COVID. And she said they really bonded over all of that, just creating this bond over shared interests. And when she asked why he wanted to move to Cal City, from Bakersfield, he told her it was because he wanted to get off the grid, which she said felt at the time like a weird statement, but she didn't really question it too much, especially because he was a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, but that was his reasoning. Now, in hindsight, could it be that he wanted to get off the grid because he wanted to get away from something or get away from something he had done? Maybe. Who knows? 
So then the loan finally closes. They have this friendship. The loan closes. Everything's great. So he goes to the office to pick up the closing paperwork from her. And this is about the end of September. She says that she wants to meet his wife and his kids because she had heard so much about him. So they walk out of the office into the parking lot to the van. She meets his wife, Jackie, and then peeks in the back of this van. But it's a conversion van, so it's a little bit private. It's one of those big white vans. And she says she couldn't identify any children's faces or the exact count of how many were in the van at that time. However, as I started probing more questions, she says she does recall a specific conversation that they had in July 2020 when they were going through the process of all this paperwork where he distinctly said he had four children. Now, she says she didn't think anything of it at the time and didn't even think it was a red flag until her conversation with me when I said, uh, hi, no, he has six kids. She said, no, 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 he was adamant. He had four. And I said, well, could he have been saying that he had two adopted and two bios or four fostered and adopted total could there be a discrepancy there and that's how he was getting to this four number and she said no he was clear that he only had four children in total and this conversation happened in july of 2020 before their move to cal city so then this of course made me wonder again so did he in fact really only have four children in his possession in july and is that the reason that they moved to Cal City to get off the grid. As she and I continued to talk, she says that he had contacted her about a week after the boys were reported missing and was complaining, saying that nobody was helping him look for the boys, that he was all alone in this, really playing up the victim card, even though there was a huge chunk of the country, in fact, that was trying to help crowdsource information and find these boys. But apparently he was very much playing the victim role here, saying, nobody's willing to help me, I just want my boys back, and really trying to lean on her, which kind of started to make me feel like maybe she was he was just trying to get in her good graces and have somebody on his side because at this point he had already done the interview which tanked and made everybody suspicious. So after all of this is emerging, everything is becoming a media frenzy. At one point people were flying drones over the backyard. It was suspected that somebody even planted sidewalk chalk on that concrete slab to explain why, you know, they were playing with the chalk in the backyard, but then that completely contradicted the story of chalk being the dog i mean it just became insane to follow it was something new all of the time and in addition to the midst of all of this these revelations and information emerging the grandmother releases a public statement and let me go over the statement with you because this statement too just had so many red flags to me let's read this statement together okay and she titles it a grandmother's plea When I learned that two of my grandchildren, the youngest, Oren and Orson, had disappeared this past December from their home in California City, I was devastated. I am still devastated and in disbelief more than three months later that this has happened to these innocent babies and they have not been found. That they are not safe and sound at home with us is horrendous. Less than 18 hours after their disappearance, we made the heart-wrenching choice to place their four brothers, my other babies, in the hands of the FBI for their protection. We had no clue what was happening or who was out there, and in an instant, all six of my grandchildren were gone, out of reach. I was shocked, hurt, worried, upset, and confused. Today, I am still in shock, hurt, worried, upset, but not confused. I am clear that my purpose and mission is to get my babies back, all six of them. Someone knows exactly where Oren and Orson are and what happened in December. Come forward. God and our family has already forgiven you and you will be free from the guilt and burden I know that you are carrying. These are babies who are loved and have an entire future waiting for them to explore. Release them and yourself from this. All we want are the boys back. Children are to be loved, cared for, and protected at all costs. To have your own grandchildren be stripped away by God knows who is a nightmare that will break down the strongest of us all. I worked hard for 29 years straight before retirement, raised three sons, and have maintained my marriage of more than 30 years, all while dealing with the pressure of being a black woman in America. I never would have imagined in my 65 plus years on this earth that this would happen to my own. If you have read this far, please continue to support the actual search for Orin and Orson. If you know something, please share truthful and fact-based information with the Bakersfield PD. Please continue to pray for my babies and their safe return. I believe one day we will wake up from this nightmare. One day, God bless, with love, Wanda West. Now there's a couple pieces in here that I 
do not like and that don't sit right with me. The first and foremost is where she says, someone knows exactly what happened to the boys. God in our family has already forgiven you. Come forward and you will be free of the guilt and the burden I know that you are carrying. It sounds to me like she possibly might know or have an inclination of who's responsible. And this almost feels as though it's like a public but direct plea to a specific person saying, we have already forgiven you. I know you're carrying a burden. Just come forward. It doesn't feel to me at least, and tell me what you guys think in the comments, that it's a broad statement. It feels very targeted. Then going towards the end of this, you know, the whatever, the fifth paragraph down or so, she makes it about herself. I worked hard for 29 years straight before retirement. I raised three sons. I've maintained my marriage of more than 30 years. No offense, lady, but nobody cares about that. I don't care about your LinkedIn profile. I don't care about how many anniversaries you've had with your husband. I certainly don't care about any of this. We all care about finding the boys. Are you trying to sell yourself here and what a great person you are? I don't know. It just sits very, very bad with me. I just felt like this entire statement in this particular paragraph wasn't necessary and kind of feels a little contrived in my opinion. But again, I want to hear what you guys think, so let me know. The biological mother of Orin and Orson also has made plenty of statements, and her name is Ryan Dean, and she has gone to the vigils and consistently prayed. And she says that she last saw her boys in 2018 around Christmas time. She also told the local news about some memories she had with them. She says that Orin loves music and used to love taking pictures with her. But in recent visits, he didn't want to be in any photos. She says Orson would always climb on her and he loves food. Whenever they played together, he would try to eat the toys that were shaped as food. I thought this was an interesting statement because she's saying that Orin used to love taking photos and then started to become reluctant to photos and didn't want any part of that. And then I also thought, which I could be reading into it, that she says Orson would always try to eat the fake food. Could he have been hungry? I don't know. I don't know. But like the fact that they were once upon a time happy, healthy, playful, love taking photos to then in recent video or then to recent visits, not that way and more reserved and shut down. I believe is indicative of something happening in that house. Orin and Orson's biological father, Charles, also has spoken out now publicly, and his, he made his first public statement 10 months after the boys were reported missing. And he says, they might not remember me, but I remember them. I'll show them. I don't care how long it takes, how hard it's going to be. I won't give up. I'll never give up. They took my family. They took my life away from me. My kids are my life. That's my family. As I mentioned, many of the relatives, including the biological family, doesn't believe that the boys ever in fact made it to Cal City. The biological dad also said, we're the only ones out here, including the supporters who are pushing for the boys. We haven't heard anything from their side of the family, the adoptive family. Now, this is interesting because we know that a lot of information is always withheld. And in fact, police admit to withholding more than 90% of the evidence in this case to protect their investigation. And while the West aren't speaking to the media, police say they do remain in contact with both of them. And it's one of those situations where they describe as you have to open a door and then it'll lead to another hallway, which then leads to another hallway. And that they're on this path and this journey to hopefully figure out what happened to these two young boys. But what I find interesting is that a public vigil is held on the 21st of every single month for these boys in hopes to generate awareness and new leads to recovering these boys. And so one of the most unsettling pieces of new information here is that Trezell and Jackie have not attended a single vigil. Now I get it. There's a lot of public outrage against them, so I could see why maybe they would want to, you know, be inside and stay behind. They haven't gone to a single vigil in a year. 12 opportunities to go and pray and gather with others and show your worry and remorse and make public outcries for anybody having information. They haven't done that, not a single time. They also haven't spoken out to the public since that horrific interview that took place two days after they were the boys were reported missing. I'm assuming because they saw how horribly wrong and sideways that interview went, but still no public cry, outcries, no public pleas, no vigil attendance, no reaching out does not sit right. 
As for recent information with this case, the Bakersfield Police Department says that they have now interviewed over 83 individuals, that 44 search warrants have been executed, and 16 mass areas have been searched and completed. They also say that the other four children of Trezell and Jackie West remain in child protective custody. The biological family and many of the supporters of this family are absolutely pleading with the public to contact and give any tips, whether it's something small or something big, you never know where it could lead. And there is an anonymous tip line that you can call, and that number is 661-322-4040. So here's where I'm at, guys. It's been almost a year since they were reported missing. The parents have gone silent. They are not helpful. They are not pleading with the public. They are not going out to any of the searches. They have not attended one single search. They have not attended one single vigil. They have not spoken out since that dreaded, dreadful interview. Nothing. So who is it up to to help crowdsource information aside from the police who, of course, yes, are doing their job? It's up to us to keep generating awareness with this story and reigniting the fire under this because it has now been almost a year since these boys were reported missing. And it truly, it's my suspicion and belief in my heart that something happened to them before they were reported missing. I don't know what you guys think, but that's my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But please share this because honestly, we need to regenerate interest in this case. It's now almost been a year. And I want to be clear, it's not, again, since they were last seen, it's been a year. It's since they were reported missing. They could have been gone months before they were reported missing or even a year before they were reported missing because remember, that last photo was from Thanksgiving 2019. Somebody out there knows something. Somebody out there has seen something. So the more we share this, the more we reignite this again, the more likely somebody may call in anonymously to that tip line or share the piece of information that ends up being the unlock in this entire case. And God forbid this becomes a recovery effort rather than a rescue, but at least if that happens, the bio family and so many of the supporters who have been searching tirelessly for these boys, at least then they will have some sort of peace and closure with this without the constant question mark and wondering of what happened to these two innocent babies, three and four years old, and truthfully, maybe even younger than that when whatever took place took place. So please, I'm asking you guys, let's reignite interest in this case. Let's light a fire under the public and do what we do best. Demand answers and not stop until we get them. We did it with the Gabby Petito case. We did it with the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell case. We have done it with so many cases out there. Still doing it with the Summer Wells case. Don't let this case be forgotten. Don't let this one go cold just because it hasn't been talked about. There are little updates that continue to happen and more Things are being said as far as new leads developing, new people being interviewed, which we see the Bakersfield Police Department just said, what, what can we do as the public? Except share this, like this video, it helps the algorithm, it'll push it out there. I mean, hopefully we can get some answers and hopefully a miracle will happen and these two little boys will be, I hope, rescued, but in the very least recovered and whoever did something to them held accountable. I have my beliefs of who I believe did something. I'm sure you have yours. Share it with me in the comments below. You know I love hearing from you. I want to know your theories. I want to know what you think about this case and where these boys could be and what may have happened to them. Thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage and I hope you do share this, like this, comment on this. I want to hear your thoughts and hopefully we get some answers soon. Until the next case, stay safe. Bye.